didn't have the the con we didn't have the the capabilities we were a few months into our acquisition with uh, with Lexar et si vous au courant were you aware potentially that GC strategies uh, I mean you qualified about staff augmentation normally you're supposed to identify the staff that's going to work in the contract in order to win the contract in this case they won the contract without identifying the staff that was going to work on it how is it possible that uh, government of Canada would award contracts without having at a prior stage identifying who st which staff would work on it because you were approached after the signature of that contract. So resources had not been identified when the a contract was awarded to GC Strategies. Yeah, so having never never worked in the staff augmentation business myself, that's not something that, uh, you know, in, in my current role, um, in my previous role, um, not something that, that we did. Um, I do have an understanding for, for how um, those in general happen. The specifics of what GC Strategies, you know, submitted, I haven't seen what that contract is. I would certainly um, um, venture the, the view that they come into agreements with independent contractors. They may have come into uh, agreements with, uh, with organizations to get the authority to use those, uh, those resources on their bid. Um, but I haven't seen that contract, so I can't, I can't speak specifically to what they would have submitted because I, wouldn't have, I just wouldn't have access to that. Et voilà. Merci beaucoup. And that's it. Thank you very much. You have the floor for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I want to return to a few items from our last, from the last test round of testimony, starting with Ms. Foster. You mentioned that you were aware of Dalian and your relationship with Dalian was one of a customer-client relationship. You denied an accusation from one of our con colleagues here related to being a subcontractor. It seems to me if you had awareness of the primary contract or the task authorization of Dalian, and you knew that you'd become a client, or they'd become a client of yours for production of work that they would then use to meet the needs of the task authorization. Isn't that the same as being a subcontractor? No, it's not the same as being a subcontractor. So being a subcontractor would mean that you um, agree to the terms of the original contract. We were not a subcontractor to the original contract. We and provided- Are you aware of that when you signed that agreement that that would be the case for subcontractors? So I, I can't speak to that. I, I don't Why have not? that information. I don't have that information. It's a simple question. Did I you have knowledge, well, Ms. Foster? Was, I'll I ask it another way. I'll ask knowledge. it another way for you. You had you were just agreed. You had knowledge of task authorizations given to Dalian. You knew that Dalian was in fact going to look for subcontractors. You can call it a client-customer relationship, but you did work for Dalian, which was doing work for. GC so strategies, I correct? I cannot agree with most of what you've just said. But did you do work for Dalian? We did work for Dalian. And did Dalian do work for GC strategies? I don't know if Dalian did work for GC strategies. Did you know that Dalian did work for the government? We were aware that the work was for the benefit of CBSA. Did you at any moment say, maybe I should contact the CBSA directly? That would have been inappropriate. You believe that it was more appropriate to work with this company, which was one person, opposed so, to working with the task with, authorization body that would issue that task of authorization all sizes that do produce work that may be a customer of ours that may be one person so you do no reviews of customers of customers well in this case you're calling Dalian a customer so i'm trying to understand your relationship with Dalian no we do you're not, saying we do not do due diligence on all of our customers and so you did not what did you know of Dalian then when you accepted that work that they worked for the government was that it we understood that they had uh, they they needed work from us. They contracted us to do work on for the benefit of CBSA, and we performed that work. But you know, as like a public service, you know that that would be strange, don't you know? Especially as a former person working in it's this not place. Strange. It's actually extremely uh, normal in the course of, of our business that a number of companies. And this is exactly why we have this problem. A number is of because of the way that your company is operating and how it's taking advantage of general contractors in this case, and they're, they're taking you, advantage Mr. of Bajor us. Thank you, That is the, the time. You'll have another opportunity. Uh, turning now to Mr. Barrett, you have the floor for five minutes, please. I want to follow up on my colleague's question about uh, Min Doan, who was the chief information officer, who's been accused of destroying documents and records related to 
Justin Trudeau's $60 million arrive scam. And this is something that the Access to Information Commissioner is investigating. Is there any reason that come to mind that emails and documents from Amazon would be in the destroyed documents? I don't have any knowledge of what documents were or weren't destroyed. Can you tell us what the total amount in contracts that Amazon has had with the Canada Border Service Agency since 2015? Uh, I don't know about the value of the contracts, but in the, the last year, we did approximately $20 million of work for CBSA. We would expect that number may fluctuate based on usage of cloud computing. How many active contracts uh, do you currently have with CBSA? Uh, I, I believe that all of the work is within one contract or the cloud framework agreement. Uh, will you undertake to provide the total amount in contracts that Amazon has had with CBSA since 2015? Could you provide that to the committee? Uh, I, I believe we could provide that. Okay. Thank you very much. How many meetings did uh, the Liberal government have with uh, Amazon on arrive cam? None. No phone calls? So by Liberal government, you mean the political level of government? Is that what you're referring to? Let's, uh, let's, let's parse it out. Who had phone calls, meetings, Zoom? So there were no, uh, nobody on my team, which is the public policy team, had any meetings with any government officials at any level on arrive cam. So no government officials, so no one who worked for the Government of Canada? Nobody who worked for the Government of Canada at the political level or the bureaucratic level. Okay. Um, so there was no connection between Amazon and the Government of Canada, any of its departments, agencies, and Amazon or any of its subsidiaries. There was no, no conversations. Well, obviously there was client engagement conversations that took place. So there was direct work that was contracted, and so there was absolutely interactions at a working level on this work, but there was no lobbying activity on this work. So there was no lobbying activity as it dealt with ArriveCan? No. So that was there, were there any gifts or hospitality by Amazon to government officials? Uh, I understand the committee has become aware of a, a backpack that was gifted to uh, both staff and, and officials that had worked on the project. Um, and that is all that I know of in terms of, of gifts. It was a small token of recognition at the end of a large so project. So no, so we, yeah, we became aware of it, but j even just in your answer before, there's no lobbying activity. So no. gifts to government officials that are branded with your logo, um, you don't consider that to be lobbying activity? No. No, you, so you haven't had any other hospitality that's been given. So just, just free bags, but no drinks, dinners, coffees, uh, anything, anything no, of I, that nature. I think in the normal course of business, there would be minimal hospitality that would have taken place. Okay, is that something that you've tracked? Uh, we do have a, a corporate policy that, that outlines what the guidelines are for that activity um, and training for employees around that activity. And yes, we do have a, a, a reporting system. Okay, so it's part of your business model that there's some gifts, that there's some hospitality um, with government officials and with the private sector. Yes? Okay, yeah. and are you able to enumerate the occasions on which it occurred with government officials, who the government officials were, and what the gifts were that were given? So our system would uh, is designed to identify who the officials were and what the gift was. Okay, can you furnish that information uh, uh, to the committee, please? I, I can follow up with that information. Thank you very much. And just to be uh, clear with precision, um, were there any uh, government officials and Amazon uh, employees who met uh, outside of government offices? And, and if yes, can that be in, that those details be included in your return to the committee? 
So in the normal course of business, meetings may take place outside of government offices. They may take place in our corporate offices. They I, may take I, under, place I understand the, the concept. I'm asking if you'll provide the details of those meetings in the return that you committed to with respect I, to your previous that, answer. That I, I would have to verify, but I do not believe we track that information in terms of the location of where meetings take place. But if it exists, you will provide it? We don't have a regular system to track that, I don't think, but if we do have it, I would be happy to provide it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, up next, uh, Srivast, uh, Ms. Bradford. Thank you, you Mr. Chair. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much to the witnesses for coming today. So could each one of the companies please answer the question about how long that you've been doing work with the Government of Canada, just for the record? I'll start with left to right. Uh, so I was in uh, uniform with the government. Uh, I'm not sure if that counts. Uh, from 1986 until 2000, worked in Treasury Board f till 2003, uh, and I've been working uh, helping government uh, since then for 20 years here at Microsoft. Microsoft, Microsoft is 20 years. Okay, or you have with them? Yeah. Yes, we Mr. have worked uh, for about 10 years uh, okay. working with the government of Canada. Mm -hmm. Ms. Foster. Um, Prior to the framework agreement in 2020, it would have been very, very minimal work. We launched our infrastructure in Canada in 2012, but it took some time for there to be uh, procurement avenues available in Canada. Okay, I just wanted to give you a chance to um, complete an answer. I think you got cut off before. Um, could you please expand on, um, you know, the difference between subcontracting and being a customer directly? So it, it's a legal differentiation. When you're a subcontractor, that means that you also adopt the original terms of, of the original contract. Um, in the case of cloud computing, that is often very difficult um, or was very difficult prior to the cloud framework agreement. The Government of Canada did not have existing legal frameworks for procuring cloud. And as I mentioned before, it is extremely, procuring cloud is very, very different than procuring hardware or software. Um, and so quite often, a lot of the terms in traditional IT contracts would be very inappropriate for cloud. And so we would not have assumed the responsibilities as a subcontractor for those terms and services. Um, instead would have been uh, uh, treated those relationships as a, as, a, as a customer of ours, not as a subcontractor to their contract. Okay, and I understood from what you said before that the work with the RiveCan app still continues and it, they're still being billed for the cloud, the cloud relationship continues. And so is that like a monthly subscription or is it based on the, the time or the usage? Yeah, it's based, it's, it's based on consumption or usage. So what's, uh, I, it's actually an ideal application for cloud in the sense that as, it, as your usage increases, for example, with increased travelers around holiday times and you reach peak, um, your, the system can accommodate those peak usages, and when you don't use those peak usage, usages, you can, uh, you'll only be billed for the use that you require at that time. And is there a minimal charge that? No. Nope. No? It's purely usage. Okay. Purely usage. Now, was Amazon involved in creating the terms of your contract when you originally? So the cloud framework agreement uh, is the same agreement that all the cloud service providers have uh, have signed the basics of the agreement, but there was a, a lot of education that had to happen with the Government of Canada to understand how to procure cloud in the lead up to the signing of that agreement. Okay. Now, the CBSA indicated that contractors were selected because they helped produce a faster result, and that's been referred to before to speed things up and uh, build the app faster. Do you agree that Amazon helped to speed up the process, and if so, how? So cloud in general speeds up the process. It, for example, if you had to ensure that you had a large enough uh, infrastructure capacity to support uh, 30 million users on the flick of a switch, is you, you w really would not be able to do that. So most organizations, including the Government of Canada, may not have enough capacity or servers to service that spike in usage so quickly. Um, and even at an accelerated pace of procurement, uh, you have to you know, decide what you're going to procure, you have to order it, then it gets delivered, then you have to install it. Um, and uh, all those things take time in a private sector context and in a public sector it may take even longer. At the time of the pandemic, there was also a limited amount of uh, tech supplies available, so it was a constrained environment. Um, we, uh, 
Am Amazon, our parent company, invented the cloud because of those challenges. So as, our, as the company was trying to innovate and build things more quickly and grow, they kept running into the same kind of capacity issues over and over again. So as Amazon worked to try to solve that problem for our company and our own usage and did that, that's actually where the cloud business was born, was that ability to sort of scale, allow others to scale quickly and grow quickly to, to reach the capacities or scales that they needed in, in a short amount of time. So that this actually is a great example of where cloud is a perfect use case for when you would want to use cloud. Okay, and can you please explain to the committee about the AWS Notify system? And was this part of the Arrive Can app? I know you said you didn't actually develop the app, but was the Notify system incorporated at all in that? So travel notification was one of the features that CBSA had designed to respond to policy. Uh, it is built on an AWS service um, called Simple Notify Service. Uh, it, it's, it's a cloud native service that we provide. We assisted with the configuration as it related to the security for CBSA, uh, but it's a service that anyone can purchase commercially or privately on AWS. And that's your time, Ms. Bradshaw, I'm afraid. Uh, beginning our third round, Mr. Genuis, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. There's one thing that I'm quite uh, struck by in today's hearing. We have Amazon, Microsoft, and BDO here, uh, three very large and serious companies, clearly. Um, it's clear that you're taking this hearing seriously and that you've done a lot of detailed preparation. That's not an endorsement of everything you've said necessarily, but you're you're clearly taking this seriously. And there there is a stark contrast between your testimony and the testimony of GC Strategies and Dalian that we've heard before Parliament. Um, Two-person companies that specialize only in getting government contracts, that were completely unprepared, that were unable to answer critical questions and badly contradicted themselves. Um, and yet, the government has gone to GC Strategies to do most of this project, uh, mostly through sole sourcing, and government officials uh, at one point conspired with GC Strategies to get them parts of, of this deal. So it seems like a, a big demonstration of problems in our procurement system. Uh, that the government has repeatedly gone to GC Strategies and, and Dalian uh, in spite of the obvious problems that have been well on display before committees. I want to ask of each of you, um, if your company ha would have had the capacity to build the Arrive Can app yourself, uh, and if you could have built all of it or at least done more of it, um, what, why, why didn't you? Why do you think it ended up that uh, it was GC Strategies and Dalian instead of uh, some of these names that Canadians would, uh, would, would recognize? So we'll start with Microsoft on that, yeah, as quickly as possible. Uh, absolutely. So Microsoft is a, a partner-driven company. We have 16,500 uh, partners in Canada that build atop a platform. And so our business model is to enable Canadian organizations to build this type of capability. So you, you, you could have built it? We don't build these but, types of But your partner companies could have, could have built it. And and uh, and and why? So why why didn't you why why didn't you put in a proposal to the government uh, through for your partners to to build the app? So our partners would lead that. We would not lead that uh, proposal. Okay. So it, we were we were hundred percent reliant on partners to build on those specialized solutions. Okay, but but wh why did none of your partners do this? I can't answer for my partners. Okay, uh, Mr. Abbott. Sure, and I, I listen. I, I certainly haven't seen all of the uh, you know specs and, and requirements and stakeholders required for uh, arrive can. I can speak to it, it's an app though basically the, the piece. It is, but I, I can yeah. only speak okay. to the, the pieces that, that we've seen. Um, and I, I certainly would not you know second guess the auditor general and their findings in terms of, of what that looked like. Um, don't have the same level of access uh, to that uh, to the to those specifications. So to the question of could we have done that, it's it's speculative. I, I don't have access to all of the the requirements that were there. I realize it's an app, but there's some complicated features, but, okay. as we found in in the optical reader technology. Did, did, did you look into building standards. it though? I mean, did, we never we never looked at. And and and, and why didn't you look into building it? Um, simply uh, at the time we didn't have the capabilities when this started. We okay. do now. But okay. we do. Ms. Foster? Um, my answer is very similar to, yeah. to okay. my Microsoft uh, colleague. I can, I can add a bit of... Uh, well, I, 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 and I, I, I get the impression that, that people don't want to go too far down the road of, of being critical of the procurement process. It, it, it just, and I don't want to put you, press you, if you, if you but it, 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 it seems like a clear problem to me that big companies, names that Canadians recognize, 
didn't even think to bid on on this critical project, uh, and yet we 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 went to GC Strategies, to Dalian, to to these to these two person shops that did no work and subcontracted it, it with all of the attendant problems. Um, just share a sure. couple of yeah. quick things for your consideration and the consideration of this committee. Um, you know, AWS would not have bid on a contract like this. It is not the kind of work that we do. However, there are two factors that I think the committee um, may want to take note of. One is the continued underinvestment in the uh, improving the digital skills of the public service. That is a long-term systemic problem. And, you know, in addition to whether or not public servants could build this, that you know that w could be part of the answer, but in addition to that, the, that part of it is you also don't have procurement officials that understand how to procure these systems properly and design the projects and manage the projects. So, it's it's not just hiring builders; it's also hiring a public service and and building a public service that has far stronger digital skills than you have today. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and just to, to comment on that, I mean, the the, the government's position seems to have been that. Th they're not capable of performing a, a general contracting function for going out and finding finding the talent to build an app, which is which is why they um, they contracted to companies who then subcontracted on most of the work. Uh, it, it's it's clearly a, a broken system uh, that that the government put it out to companies that that simply went on LinkedIn, found people, and and subcontracted it. Uh, I, I don't know if it's interference or if it's um, or if it's a lack of digital skills or something else, but but clearly Thank the you, system is, Mr. is badly Genuous, broken. That Thank is you. your time. Uh, Ms. Shanahan, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Well, thank you very much, Chair, and I thank the witnesses for being here today. Uh, and uh, just a, 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 on that theme, uh, I appreciate, um, uh, Ms. Foster, your, your comments regarding the um, civil service, uh, that there's a, clearly a, um, uh, um, a lack of capacity uh, there. It's a longstanding problem that has been exasperated at different points by cutting of the civil service and um, and certainly alienating uh, people that um, that could uh, uh, contribute to uh, to the um, expertise in in this area and um, so I appreciate that and I think that that's probably something that this uh, committee is going to be recommending uh, in the future I've seen it in other committees but it definitely it's something to be uh, recommended because I, I can say that I have a son working for Amazon and I'd love to bring him back from Seattle to uh, to work here in, in Canada. So um, back to the questions that were being asked earlier about the a a AWS platform. Um, can you talk to us and and that might be Mr. Marcou around the cybersecurity um, aspects of um, the AWS platform? Yeah, so specific to our, our work on ArriveCAN, there was a, a significant component of it at, um, related to security. Uh, security, in the case of the federal government, is defined by the government in terms of the security controls, guardrails, uh, authority to operate, audit criteria. And so our work was to configure AWS to comply with all that, all those regulations, and uh, assure that CBSA was able to pass those audit checks and, and requirements throughout the whole process. So. Uh, as part of our engagements, a minimum of 15% of anything that we do, um, we dictate as being security related. In this case, it was a far higher ratio than that, just given that we were configuring systems to contain things like vaccine credentials, passport credentials, personal identification, um, automated purging and destruction of data, post retention period. So I would say the bulk of our work was related to um, security to meet Government of Canada requirements. Well, and, and thank you very much for reminding us that indeed it was uh, during a, a period of um, uh, high emergency, uh, critical period, uh, no one knew, uh, you know, what was going to happen next as far as um, the, the health crisis, the pandemic, uh, preparedness and so on. And so that's why the expertise that your companies uh, were able to provide was, was critical for us. Uh, that being said, uh, we are where we are today because there was uh, the Auditor General's report and uh, uh, grave concerns that, that she had uh, concerning the 
uh, value for money, uh, not so much the value for money uh, because it's, a, it's an enduring application, but certainly the lack of documentation uh, around um, the uh, contracting and subcontracting that went on. Um, have any of you spoken to the RCMP regarding the Arrive Can application? I'll start, Mr. No. Oh, Ms. sorry. No, sorry. No, we have not. No, Mr. Abbott. No, we have not. Mr. No, we have not. Right. We have not no. been contacted. Mr. Mr. I have not Cody. been contacted. Excellent. And have any of you um, spoken to um, anyone else looking at the issue, like the Auditor General? No, I have not. No. No. Uh, the Auditor General did reach out to us to uh, verify the number in her report. Um, that is the extent of our communication with the Auditor General. Okay, very good. We received advance notice from the Auditor General that we would be named in the report. Uh, we received advance notice from the Ombudsman uh, report as well. Um, that was the extent of communication. Mm -hmm. We received advance notice from the Auditor General that we'd be named in the report and uh, we're given the dollar value. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. And um, uh, if you're asked, um, will you cooperate with the ongoing investigations into the Arrive Can application? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Uh, we've, we've continued to cooperate with all inquiries. Okay. Yes. Thank you, and thank you very much uh, for your work and your service. Thank you. That's all. All done. You. you have 30 seconds, Ms. Shannon, if you have any other questions, but I think you're done. If, there, if any of the witnesses would like to add to uh, previous answers. Mm -hmm. You still have 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, so uh, regarding the work that was done uh, during the pandemic, uh, can you just speak, uh, Ms. Foster, to uh, other work that Amazon may or may not have performed during those early days? Uh, I, I don't have much to add in terms of the work that we did on um, on Arrive Can specifically. I'll, I'll maybe just use the opportunity to promote a report that we worked on prior to the pandemic uh, in cooperation with the Public Policy Forum that looked at strategies the Government of Canada could be uh, using to increase its recruiting and retention of digital talent. Um, and I would be happy to table copies of that report with this committee, um, but it included uh, considerations around, um, you know, upskilling in current talent, uh, how to actually recruit talent. Um, it's a highly competitive environment, and there are uh, there's certainly challenge, structural challenges that the government of Canada has in terms of uh, potentially language requirements, but how jobs are actually classified. Um, within the public service. So there are some very tangible things that the Government of Canada could do uh, sooner rather than later to start to kind of address the talent gap that we see in terms of digital skills in the public service. We'd also be really happy, and I know um, other companies share this um, desire to uh, help the Government of Canada and, um, you know, through training both both uh, some, uh, we both all, all of us offer quite a bit of additional free training um, that is available not just to government county employees but to the general public, um, and would love to kind of work closer with government to further that um, to further that goal. Thank you, thank you very much. Encore une fois, Once again, Ms. Sinclair de Gagné, two, two minutes and thirty seconds. Thank you very much, Chair. You're ready for the interpretation. Very good. Mr. Abbott, I'm coming back to you once again. Did you see the Auditor General's report as well as the Ombudsman's report on the Arabcan? In certain places, there is detail about certain resources billing the government for amounts for years of experience that went back 10 to 15 years when they didn't actually have that number of years of experience. Were you aware of that? I, I, I'm aware of that from... Um, I'll just suspend the meeting, or hold hold on for a second, I'll suspend until the member gets his phone under control, so very good. Uh, I've stopped the clock, but you have the floor. I, I am aware from within the report, having read it, yes. Dans le rapport, dans In the contract, GC Strategies contract with the government, we have a resort, Mr. Cor Ms. McDonald at uh, Luxor, build 
the highest amount for an individual of $1,500 per hour, where it's at the time of the signing of the contract was only six years' experience. Normally, it should have been 10. What do you have to say about that, Mr. Abbott? Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that specifically, so I, I, can't, I can't comment to it. I mean, if it... If, I, I haven't seen it, but I... Ma, ma question, uh, est très... My question is very specific. Did BDO invoice that highest rate, or was it GC Strategies that billed it and then pocketed the difference? I would have to go back to look to see the specifics vérifier, of it. And... Could you please check? Because this is exactly an instance of bad practices where taxpayers are paying a lot more for, than they should pay. It's just an example. If you peruse the contracts, you'll come across a number of resources who build more than the, what they should have billed the government in re, with regard to their years of experience. And I would have the same questions. I mean, we could peruse the contracts in detail, but to your knowledge, Ms. Foster, does that could it happen? And might it happen when uh, Dalian, uh, you know, uh, got the contract, you did the work, even if it wasn't subcontract, could that happen to Amazon ser Web Services? No. Jamais. Donc, si on retourne dans les contrats, on ne trouvera pas de code. Peruse the contracts, we would never find that, to your knowledge. And Mr. Veget? Contracts that would be contracted directly with us, and we have donc, controls in place to uh, make sure that people have the correct qualifications. D'accord, parfait. Donc, je reviens. Thank you very much. So I want to come back to you, Mr. Abbott. If, indeed, you were to realize that there was overbilling on the part of BDO, what would you do? Would you reimburse the government for the difference? The over or should the government ask GC Strategies for the reimbursement? Yeah, so I, I will comment on, on the broader question that was just asked as well. So we, we will follow the contracts. We always follow the contracts in, in bill in accordance with the level of, of resource. I really can't speak if, if GC Strategies has done that. I, I would have no line of sight. Um, as the prime contractor, they would typically be the, the organization that you would you would have a, a you know, a, a, certainly an issue with. Um, Go ahead, please. Yeah, but but for sure, we'll we'll have a look at what that earlier request was. But I just have to say, from from our perspective, um, we follow, you know, as BDO Canada, we follow our our processes in terms of billings and statements of work and, and the contract. Et voilà, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Usually for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I do want to just summarize the seriousness of today's meeting and how serious it is that Canadians get a grapple with and understanding how procurement works in Canada. And the, one of the most shocking admissions today, I think, was by Ms. Foster and Amazon Web Services' relation to the knowledge of the fact that you could not be held legally liable or responsible for a contract or a task authorization held by Dalian if you are, in fact, a customer of that, of that company. This is the first instance of this in our committee happening, and I think this is of utmost importance to our analysts and for our study and report to investigate in addition to subcontractors, any customers of Dalian and GC Strategies for the production of work related to ArriveCan. It's a serious issue that I believe requires serious accountability, considering that Amazon Web Services is of the top three financial records, according to the Auditor General, at $7.9 million. This is something that I think the government should be aware of and seized with, that it's of utmost importance that they understand that accountability mechanisms by and large, set to protect the public service and value for money, are not being met. Should a company act like that of Amazon's and look at Dalian, do no assessment of that company, which was admitted in this testimony, in addition to having no uh, oversight of the companies they take on, not with knowledge that Dalian, in fact, had a responsibility to CBSA, agreed then to continue to work as a customer knowing that the potential for amendments to TAF authorizations and amendments to the cost effective to those task authorizations could change, ballooning the cost. The Auditor General makes very clear in this report that the cost and value for money for Canadians was not achieved, particularly by way of manipulation of the task authorization process. This is quite serious. 
and it's one that I think will require further investigation. And Mr. Chair, I think any information that can be supplied to this committee in relation to the testimony today on the contract between Dalian and that of Amazon Web Services would be of great importance to this committee and our study on behalf of Canadians and value for dollar. Would you be willing to submit that contract that you had between Dalian and your corporation for the purpose of our study and understanding how or what work you did on behalf of Dalian in its total? Would you be willing to submit the contract? The, the contract is available on our website. It is our terms and service. It is a click-through contract. It is the same service terms we use with all customers. No, I understand it is, that. It is, it is available. Do you understand how it's connected to the task authorizations? So the terms and services of using cloud services does not change regardless of the customer using those services. But what about the task authorizations? Should there, they change? So the task authorization would be a separate question, but you asked about the contract. But you wouldn't be privy to that knowledge, would you? Whether or not Dalian submitted an amendment to a task authorization based on your work, you would not know that, correct? No. Exactly. That's the problem I'm, seeing, I'm, I'm saying, Ms. Foster. That is the issue present to Dalian, and that is the issue present no, to Canadians. I, I think there's a no, please, Ms. Foster. Is it, it's how important cloud that it is important no, that you I'm, I'm understand how let, cloud let, services are. Let, it's not a question. Let, let, is, let me interject. Is, well, it um, be a question. Let, let me interject. The, the, your, your time uh, has has expired. I I, I, I listened just because I, I wanted to see where you're going with it as well. The analyst had some questions about your. Uh, request so oh, please. for for me yeah. could you could you just um, just explain um, your concern and how you see the committee uh, I don't think I want the witnesses to answer it um, but I'd like exactly. I'd like I'd like us th through through me and the analyst uh, for the analyst just um, yeah no thank you chair that's an important question the task authorizations to which the auditor general says there was amendments to those as task authorizations particularly the task authorizations that were amended by Dalian. Those task authorizations may, in fact, implicate w additional work done by Amazon Web Services that was not in, in the initial task authorization, which was one of the recommendations of the Auditor General. So just speaking to the Auditor General's recommendation and understanding why amendments to task authorizations were taking place, without knowledge of where Dalian came up with the need for the production of amendments is an important process in understanding how the costs could increase. And as a customer of Dalian, Amazon Web Services, we don't know the relationship is the problem between the work that they had done, the task authorizations, and Dalian. So I think this is incredibly important. Okay. And so I think that we need information related to the amendments of the task authorizations and its applicability to the work of Amazon as a customer of Dalian. Okay, um, I hope that was somewhat helpful. It, 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 yes, um, I think we'll pick this up again in the subcommittee. Um, Ms. Foster, as a starter, it's it's publicly available. Could you submit it nonetheless? Just the 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 contract that is available. If we have further questions, we'll come back to you. Is that uh, fair enough for a start? It's very simple okay. to perform that. I have Perfect. To do that. Thank you. Uh, let, th yeah, through me, and I'll yeah go ahead. Just on the, uh, yeah, through you, Chair, correspondence related to these ta to the tasks of Dalian and the outcomes or deliverables related to the work that Amazon Web Services had done that, direct that are directly cited in the task authorizations. Any re relevant information that Dalian, through a task authorization that is, was then offloaded to the work of Amazon, we need to know what that yeah, work we might is. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to get a, to, uh, an, an answer from Ms. Foster, um, but we might have to circle back around. Uh, is that is that something you could provide or? And uh, we, we don't operate under a task authorization okay. system, so no, we wouldn't be able to produce it because it's not how. That's how, how thank you. Our work is engaged. So, so communication between them and Dalian. I would have to see what we would yeah. we would still have. I mean, the work that we did with Dalian was f over five years ago now. Okay, I think it'd be important to see oh, yeah, the information. Tell you what, Mr. Gigli, let's 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 discuss it um, in subcommittee business. Sure. Um, and Mr. Ms. Foster has proven to be a, a, a candid witness today, and uh, if we have questions, we'll get back to you, and we'll see where we we end up. Um, and I, I do hear what you're saying about the 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 timeline. Um, so let's, yeah, I'd, I'd rather have a, a longer discussion uh, when we're not on the clock. I have two more, two more members to ask questions, but I, I uh, your concerns have been flagged.
and I, I, I think there's, I think, I think we can, we, we will certainly discuss it, and we'll see where it goes. Is that all right for now, Mr. Digley? But your, your concerns have been raised, and noted. Um, I'll turn now to Mr. Genuus, the second last uh, member. You have the floor for five minutes, please, and Mr. Chen will finish up for the day. Uh, over to you, Mr. Genuus. Uh, thank you, Chair. Ms. Foster, I want to ask you about the contracts that Amazon had with Dalian. Uh, you had said earlier worth uh, $1.1 million in total. Uh, were all of these contracts uh, ones for which CBSA was the ultimate beneficiary of the work? Uh, yes. So the initial, the initial program of work was really related to a migration that had nothing to do they, they needed I understand assistant. they were distinct from Arrive Can, yeah. Okay, so they needed assistant with, with migrating workloads to the cloud. Um, that support was provided, and then there was a very, uh, it is less than $100,000 of work that could be, re that we can sort of identify as being related to Arrive Can, but it was a very minimal amount okay. of work. Okay, so it was, it was migrating uh, services to, to the cloud, doing that for Dalian, for which CBSA was the ultimate um, b beneficiary. Were there multiple companies working for Dalian on these projects, or were basically you were the ones that were providing that work for Dalian? Uh, on this one, we would have no line of sight on who Dalian was working with outside of us. Okay, but but for but for the specific project, um, you didn't have line of sight on any other companies involved. They they received a contract for CBSA to to do what in general. The, to, to do that same migration? We don't know specifically what their contract was for with CBSA. Um, and in the case of this migration piece of work, we just had our own contract. We were not working with any other firms at the time and had no visibility. Okay. Uh, but were the, these, were, these were CBSA files or CBSA information. It wasn't Dalian internal files. It was, it was CBSA's information that you were moving to the cloud uh, a, 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 as part of a, of a contract that you had with Dalian, is that correct? It was CBSA workloads. Right, okay. So you were moving CBSA workloads to the cloud, uh, but Dalian had hired you to, to do that. Um, Dalian is notionally a, a, an indigenous company, which means that it benefits from indigenous set-asides in procurement. Um, is Amazon an indigenous company, and were any of the employees who worked on this project for Dalian uh, indigenous? No, we are not an indigenous company, and um, I, there may have been employees that were indigenous that worked on the project, but I, we, I can't say yes or no. Okay. Do, do you have a sense of what percentage of your overall workforce uh, is indigenous? Uh, we, I, we do in Canada, but I don't recall that number um, off the top of my head. Okay, ballpark, is it, is it the same as the proportion in the overall population, a little higher, a little lower? Uh, that would be a good ballpark, but I, I'm honestly okay. not sure. Okay. Um, what I'm trying to understand about the, the procurement system here is that um, Dalian uh, identifies as an Indigenous company. It benefits from Indigenous set-asides in getting procurement. In the case of these projects with CBSA, uh, they, they may have, in the process of getting these, this contract, benefit benefited from that set aside. Uh, they then uh, subcontracted to you, but pardon me, they, they didn't subcontract to you. As you said, they, they hired you to do the work um, and you are not an indigenous company. Um, so that, it seems like a good deal for you. You, you, you were hired to, to do work. It seems like a good deal for Dalian in that uh, they, they don't have internal IT capacity. They, presumably didn't add value uh, to the project. Um, they made money, you made money, uh, but because of their involvement, um, they taxpayers paid more, and uh, this seems like a pretty significant manipulation of the Indigenous set-aside rule. Um, do, you, do you have a sense of why Amazon didn't just get this contract directly to move those, uh, those files to the cloud? Uh, is it is it because of a requirement f around indigenous procurement, uh, or is there some re other reason why you didn't get that contract directly? So we we don't have visibility on what the overall scope of work was that Dalian was hired to do by the government of Canada. So, uh, for you know, we there could have been a much broader scope of work that included other potential elements that were delivered as part of their contract with the government of Canada. So there's a lot of information we don't have. Um, to confirm some of your suspicions. 
In terms of why the government of Canada did not procure with us directly, at the time, the government did not have the ability to procure cloud services. Um, they did not have. Sorry, what does that mean? They don't have the ability to procure cloud. They didn't have a procurement vehicle to buy cloud. So, 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 so they essentially, they didn't have the the bureaucratic structures in place. Correct. Okay, but but that that seems like a like a bizarre and arbitrary barrier. You're the ones that can do the work. They need you to do the work. Uh, but but for some bureaucratic and technical reason, they decided they had to go through Dalian uh, when when they could have just called you and hired you. I. Uh, I think you are pointing to um, some of the the elements of why having uh, really good procurement policies in place is really important. So having appropriate practices and policies in place to buy the technology that you need is an extremely important element in thinking about uh, you know any digital transformation initiative, it, whether you're a government or a private sector enterprise. Um, you know, there are elements that you have to have in place in order to do things well. One of those, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is, is the appropriate kind of talent and workforce to actually lead the project. Another really important element is the ability to actually procure what you need and have the right uh, rules around the procurement of that technology. The third actually is an extremely important element for the people in this room, and that is leadership. These are change management projects. They require leadership in order to drive um, and ensure that they're able to be executed. Change management is extremely difficult in any organization, and it's especially difficult in a public sector one. And then the fourth is understanding how to actually budget for operational expenses in an IT environment. Traditional IT procurement is for capital assets, and, and most organizations are still grappling with how to budget for those expenses in an operational sense. So there's a number of elements of what the Government of Canada and all organizations are grappling with in order to have those elements of how to do digital transformation appropriately. So Actually, not Ms. having Foster, I'm, policies I, Ms. Foster, I'm going to stop you there, the but I am sure our next member will probably ask you to continue if they're of interest. I'm just way over the, the time for Mr. Genuis's uh, uh, line, but that was interesting. Mr. Chen, you have the floor. Of course, you're welcome to pick it up. Uh, with any questions or allow Ms. Foster to clear answer, I will, of course, let, let, let you decide that. You have five minutes, sir. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I, I will um, ask uh, Ms. Foster to finish, but I, I will premise that by just saying that I appreciate um, the presence of all the witnesses here uh, today. You have um, shed light on the relationships or lack thereof you have um, with uh, Dalian, with GC Strategies. And you have been dragged into this conversation around ArriveCan. It's, um, to me, uh, the most intriguing part of what you have discussed is um, what I see as the, the larger project, uh, as, as Ms. Foster is alluding to, of, of digital adoption and transformation within government. Um, it, it certainly is a, a monumental task, but um, this ArriveCan situation, I, I believe, has certainly provided important lessons that government can take forward um, as we continue down a road of um, increasing technology. Uh, Ms. Foster, your job title includes uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, that certainly is, is um, high on the radar. And, uh, and the challenges you, you have um, highlighted with respect to, um, to, to the, the leadership that's needed for, for change management, uh, the, the, the modernizing procurement um, that was raised earlier, uh, and, and certainly building the, the understanding of technology and the capacities within, within government itself. Um, uh, so uh, please, Ms. Foster, please continue with um, your, your, um, your, your testimony. I was getting very quickly to wrapping up my point, but um, you know, these are the four pillars that organizations need to consider as they embark on digital transformation projects. Um, the other thing that I would love to leave this committee with is that we know that Canadians are eager to interact with their government um, and access uh, ser government services on a digital basis. So, uh, you know, the experience of the pandemic was an acceleration of some of those out of necessity and the uh, need to social distance. But we know that Canadians um, have become very accustomed to accessing services digitally, whether it's 
buying things on Amazon or listening to music on Spotify um, or, um, you know, applying for a driver's license. So Canadians want to be able to access these services digitally, I think is a really important, um, it, it is extremely important that government is able to undertake these projects um, in a, in a, in the way that that government that Canadians expect in terms of accountability and due diligence and a very very high bar on security which we um, you know wholeheartedly support uh, but we have to make sure that the systems that we're working in are actually designed for the purpose of, of the objectives that we're trying to meet on behalf of Canadians and so um, you know this these are difficult it's it's always difficult when maybe a project doesn't go as well as people would like um, many of us have been involved in um, both successful projects and projects that you learn a lot on. And, uh, you know, we have to ensure that we, uh, we don't give up on trying to achieve those goals. I, I appreciate your focus as, as companies that provide uh, cloud services and the um, advisory services that, that go along with it. Uh, you have worked, I am sure, on many different projects that involve third-party application development um, integrated with your cloud services. Um, it, how common is it that you see situations like Arrive Can where costs have um, ballooned, where there seems to be a lot of chaos in 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 transforming a paper-based process, and and of course this was done in a in a very tight timeline, under very unusual circumstances of the pandemic. What is your assessment of how bad it it, it got with with the arrive can situation compared to to what you normally see um, in very traditional organizations and and their big step forward that they try to take. So if there's a couple things I can I can share for consideration of the committee, and uh, maybe Nick, I'll turn to you to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about FinOps. But um, you know, we we have a whole kind of uh, uh, stream around cloud economics. So understanding how you build and then how you optimize that over time is a process for most organizations. So when a when an organization starts to migrate workloads to the cloud. Um, and that could be uh, our cloud or other clouds, you generally see the initial stages of that uh, really quite spiking in cost. Because as organizations are building, they're using more services, they're accessing professional services to support that, um, and learning as they go. And then uh, customers, uh, you know, so you, you see a, a, star, a stark climb in the beginning of those uh, efforts. And then as customers become more sophisticated about their use of services, uh, what you see is this as a process of optimization. So you see, you the trend is is that you become um, more sophisticated at how to use those services, and we work very closely with customers to try to reduce their costs. So it's part of uh, what we do. In addition to that, our company has reduced costs uh, over 130 times since uh, we launched our business in 2006. So we're always trying to find those efficiencies within what we do, but also working with customers to find those as well. And maybe you can talk a little bit about. Uh, um, some of the specific kind of work that we do around that. Yeah, so I would say, uh, to answer your question around how we engage and what we're seeing globally, um, clearly there's a global trend towards digital innovation. We see it every day, generative AI, several technologies. Uh, the reason we have a public sector focused business in Canada as AWS is to enable this in Canada. Uh, we as well are a partner driven organization. Certainly you can hire and access AWS engineers uh, which was the case in our team to help accelerate, to help identify and demonstrate new technology. Um, and our advice was and will remain, Canada should continue to push forward on innovation and employ the organizations uh, that are leading this innovation globally. Thank you. That is your time. And thank you, representatives from Amazon Web Services, BDO Canada, Microsoft Canada, for your testimony today and participation in this study in relation to the Report 1 of Arrive Can. Uh, you are all excused. We're going to continue some committee business here. Um, I know there's some follow-ups that, uh, that will happen as well, and we look forward to receiving those. Thank you very, very much. Um, would members like me to suspend for... Two minutes, yes, I will suspend for, I know we're getting close, I do have resources. My intention is to finish up quickly. I'll suspend for two minutes.
right off the top, could I have just some housekeeping items, uh, some budgets to adopt for future studies? Um, looking for report two, housing and First Nations communities. These are all sent to you uh, for $1,500. Could I have approval for this budget, please, or in the opposition? That is passed. Uh, report three, First Nations and Inuit policing program. Again, for $1,500. Is that uh, approved? Yes, no dissent. Thank you. And report four, National Trade Corridor Fund, Transport Canada, uh, for $1,500. Yes, good. Thank you very much. Very good. We're going to go over um, the subcommittee meeting we had uh, recently. And uh, of note, I'm just negotiating with the subcommittee members for a follow-up meeting based in part on uh, any feedback out of this and just kind of plan next steps. Uh, I will say off the top, the deadline for uh, Arrive Can Witnesses, as my email, is tomorrow noon. Given that it's caucus day, that probably really means tonight for most members because we're all... Uh, locked up without our devices, uh, or at least some of us are, for uh, for caucus meetings. So just flag that to, to you and your and your teams. Um, so if I could ask the subcommittee meetings just to members just to meet me uh, right after the meeting, so we can we can uh, try to agree on uh, a time uh, for the for the next meeting. All right. So on March 21st, why don't I go, I'll go through this and then see if I got it more or less correct. Um, and then we'll uh, pick it up from there. So I'm just going to go through it. Uh, there's about eight points. On March 21, your subcommittee met to discuss uh, and prioritize upcoming business and review the calendar. Uh, we will have a meeting on the 11th on Report 2, Housing and First Nations Community. We'll have a meeting on the 16th on Report 4, National Trade Corridors Fund. Uh, we will then have Ms. Anan in the first hour uh, on the 18th. This is per a motion that was, uh, that was passed by this committee, but also was, uh, was discussed and approved, uh, reinforced in, sub in the subcommittee. Uh, and we'll have the OAG, the Auditor General, on the main estimates in the second hour. This, is, this is, again, was discussed in subcommittee. It's also something that we as a committee do uh, automatically. Uh, on April 30th, we'll meet on the topic of Report 3, First Nations and Inuit policing program. Uh, these studies reflect the priorities alongside Arrive Canada as provided by the parties of committee. I suppose I would, I would note that um, I, think, I think everyone agreed on there were a number of, of kind of top priorities and I would say that everyone um, uh, as provided we kind of settled on everyone's top two list. Some parties uh, had a longer list um, others were quite were quite focused, and so what I did with the calendar was uh, fill up what was agreed to. There was a a, a, a request from Mr. Desjardins for possibly additional um, studies on the the indigenous studies, and before we went too far down that path, um, Mr. Desjardins agreed to first have these meetings, and we'd come back to the subcommittee to to discuss uh, next step. I'm, the clerk and I are still working to find a date for Minister Blair as per a motion that was passed by this committee. Um, and we've scheduled, um, as per the study on the public accounts 2023, with the Bank of Canada and the CPP in, uh, Investment Board. Uh, this had previously been agreed to as part of a broader study of the public accounts 2023. We were able to hear from witnesses from the uh, the government members, as well as the uh, the Bloc uh, Québécois, uh, and these last two are for the Conservatives and the uh, and the NDP. Uh, we will also be hosting an informal meeting with Indonesian lawmakers uh, on their Public Accounts Committee on May 23rd. Uh, after our regular uh, meeting, this obviously is is more in the area of uh, our, our diplomatic uh, relations as lawmakers. Uh, they're hoping to come in to see our committee uh, in uh, uh, doing its, uh, its norm normal business in public, so we'll try to find something on the calendar for that and then to have a discussion with them afterwards. And, fin and finally, we finalized wording for INAN committee letter, uh, which was distributed to you all and then sent to that committee, again, as per a motion that was passed in this, uh, in this, in this committee. So that's really the, the, the discussion we had and the best that... Uh, uh, I could distill it with uh, with the assistance from uh, the clerk. So I'm happy to take comments on it, and uh, and 
we'll see where we're at there. I think Mr. Desjardins was first. Oh, no, no. Oh, pardon, Madame Sinclair Desjardins. Je m'excuse. C'est pourquoi on a not great. I do apologize. That's why we have our clerk to help us. Thank you. Very quick question. You mentioned Ms. Anand. Could you remind us of the context of the topic? To, uh, Peut-être trouver la, 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 la motion. Peut-être tu peux, peux, peux me parler. With regard to Ms. Anand, I'll have to, I'll have to look that up. It was for one hour, it, and our clerk will look for the the, the uh, motion. Back to you, Madame Secretary. Did you a point you wanted to raise, Mr. Jigley? Uh, not a point, but just uh, for the members who weren't present at the subcommittee, <coughs> the two reports specific to the ones that the Auditor General tabled. My intention is to, however, speak more broadly to the Auditor General's comments in several audits, not just the policing and the housing audit, but in its totality. You may, you may recall the third audit on clean water that she tabled here, 20 years of neglect. She said it was beyond unacceptable. She asked this committee to do more to find ways to ensure that those recommendations weren't just agreed to by the department, but that there was actually will to see them enforced. And those are, that's the context to why I think a serious set of meetings on several issues, of, several issues pertaining to First Nations people above the policing and housing to include as well clean water, of course, the study that we had reviewed in 2022. Other comments? Are members satisfied? And of course, the subcommittee will pick things up uh, again soon. Yes, Ms. Yip. I had also mentioned that um, I would like these studies to be considered. The uh, first report under Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, and as well as the discretionary powers to protect species at risk. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, et puis uh, on va retourner. Yes, and We'll turn to our clerk now. So with regard to the motion for Ms. Anand, the committee invite the Treasury Board President, Anita Nan, to appear for at least two hours on the Arrive Can study and that the meeting unfold in the three weeks following the adoption of the motion. We are in for Madame We don't say just once again. No, no. I just wanted to answer, Ms. Yip, or we could address this in the subcommittee, but in answer to a question in the meeting on the force, that has already happened. I don't know that we can add more reports to what has already. Well, we'll talk about it in the subcommittee. Any other comments? Yes. All right. Just a, a note to the subcommittee. Uh, we will probably begin to meet uh, more frequently so we can have a, an airing of witnesses and a discussion about priorities that will come from both the government side and the opposition side to plan out uh, the, the calendar. So if there's nothing else, I will just highlight that our next meeting will be on Thursday.